Whether you're a full stack developer or a non-technical no coder, at some point you've asked yourself this question, how in the world do web apps and websites work? The tools, the apps and websites that we all use every day are all somehow connected, but unraveling how it all works can feel a little bit confusing. Josh from Builder here. And in this video, we're going to give you the 10,000 foot view that you need to understand how web apps are built. Web apps are complicated. There's front ends of what you see. There's back ends that have data and functions happening all over the place. But the reality is it's a much simpler process when you really pull it all together and understanding just what happens is really step one. So let's go ahead and dive right in and give you that foundation so that you can start building your very own web applications today. Now, the first thing that you probably think of when you think of a web app is what you see and interact with on the screen. This is most often known as the front end of an app. And you may also hear this side of the app referred to as the client's side. It's the actual device requesting the information and displaying it to you, the end user. As the client, when you type in a URL, maybe you click on a button or a link, you're requesting something to be sent or served to you. Not unlike ordering food at a restaurant, it's the server's job to interpret that order and give you what you asked for. So the server side or the back end matches your request and sends you a specific file that contains all of the directions your client side browser needs to know to show you what you've asked for. Those directions come with three distinct languages included. HTML that tells the browser what is on the page, CSS that tells you what those things should look like, and JavaScript that tells you how those things should behave logically. So it's at this point that two things begin to happen. Let's go ahead and pull up the Builder Twitter profile as an example. First, locally on your computer, your browser starts to get to work rendering the elements from the HTML in the layout and the styles CSS has told it to, as well as setting in the interactions on the items that the JavaScript is doing. But one thing that you'll notice as we look at this clip again, the first thing that we see on the Twitter profile is not all of the data. What we see is the framework for the page. We see the menu items. We see the outline and placeholder for the right-hand menu and the timeline. But what we don't see is the actual content on the timeline, the tweets from the account. We don't see the recommended follows and we don't see trending news or topics. And so what's happening at that point is the JavaScript actually is putting in some follow-up orders from the server. And sometimes JavaScript is really picky and it might even be ordering from a few different servers to go get custom data to put it into the page that you're seeing. And so in this case, one of the things it's looking at is what's the actual Twitter account in the URL? Oh, it's Builder HQ. It's also looking for things like what user is logged in here? And let's make sure we're pulling up the trending news items to show here on the right-hand sidebar as well. These series of requests to go get additional data are called API calls. And they generally use a format for most of that data called JSON. JSON is more data format than programming language, but it's the ultimate translation tool different code bases use to send information to each other. The most important thing to know about APIs is it's the main mechanism most computers use to send and receive data securely. Whether that's getting the data from the correct profile info on your page or setting off a brand new tweet. But APIs aren't just for getting your internal app to do things. APIs are how web apps across the world communicate to each other. So it's an API that lets you build a custom chatbot with OpenAI or send someone to Stripe to check out for your app or even add a new contact to your CRM once they sign up. These servers that the client keeps interacting with can be located anywhere in the world. And typically for apps with users, there's two servers you're actually interacting with. First, the primary server that is normally holding all of the data and information you're requesting. And then the identity server is there to authenticate the user and make sure users can only request data that they have real permissions to access. These servers work together to make sure that the correct data is served up to the correct user quickly and securely. So to deliver that perfect client side experience, you've got a variety of layers to put together a full stack. You've got your front end on the client side that is actually the user experience made up of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. 
And then you've got your backend consisting of the data collections where you're storing all your data, the APIs that connect your front end to the back end securely, your global storing and hosting of your website files, and then finally your user servers to keep all of your data and users secure. So to build this, that means either spending years of time learning basically five plus new foreign languages, or it means finding and hiring teams of people who specialize in each one of these languages to work together. To make web app development more accessible, we have to make it simpler, faster, and cheaper to do. To do that, we need to massively lower the learning curve and simplify down into a single platform. That's where the builder stack comes in. Builder brings all of these layers together into the same no-code interface without sacrificing the flexibility of a full code solution so that you can build your apps fast and iterate quickly and know that you're still able to scale your app without having to rebuild it from the ground up. Stick around to learn more about the builder stack and how you can start building your application step-by-step, -step, completely visually in a no-code-first framework.